Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Inhaled Insulin, glucose management in the moment, and by Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, my son, who lives with type 1, spent the summer away at a regular non-diabetes sleepaway camp. Eight weeks managing all of his own care with no remote monitoring from us. You had a lot of questions, including how he manages overnight lows. You know when you wake up from a really good nap, you're kind of sweaty, you kind of like, you got like the marks on you. It's that, but more like discombobulated. And I check my decks, come on, I'm like, oh, I'm low. Juice box. Benny is 17. He was diagnosed just before he turned two. And as usual, he has a lot to say. He had quite a few adventures at camp, but everything turned out all right. We get his take on independence and responsibility. It's a glimpse into how a teen with type 1 thinks. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. Welcome to another week of the show. I am your host, Stacey Sims, and you know we aim to educate and inspire about diabetes with a focus on people who use insulin. I'm always so glad to have you here. I'm always so nervous when I talk to Benny for these episodes. He's great. Don't get me wrong. I'm so thrilled that he's open and wants to talk about this and answer your questions. But, you know, I, as I've shared in the past, because we are not perfect with diabetes, I do worry sometimes about putting all this out there into the public eye. So as you listen, uh, be kind. But I, I got to say, you all are always so receptive. And I hear from many of you that you really enjoy these episodes because he is so open and honest about how he thinks about type one. But before we get to that, I need to let you know that registration for Diabetes Connections Presents Mom's Night Out is open. The ticketing page is live. The hotel link is live with the group discount rate. Oh my God, I'm so excited about this. So you can just go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the events tab. This is an event I'm putting on in January in Charlotte, North Carolina for moms of kids with diabetes. I've been in this community for 16 years and I have never been to an event like this, a standalone two-day conference like this just for moms. So if this sounds like your jam, I would urge you to sign up early. Tickets are limited. I had a really incredible response just to the save the date for this. So I know there's a need. If you're not in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, but you're in driving distance or this kind of thing really appeals to you, just come. As I said, we've got a hotel block. It's a two-day conference. You can learn more at diabetes-connections.com. I really hope to see you there. It's going to be so much fun. And if you're interested in reaching these moms, if you're an organization, a company, if you're looking to sponsor this, we have lots of opportunities. So definitely reach out and let me know. I'd love to hear from you. All right. A couple of things about this interview. The sound might be a little bit more choppy than usual. That has nothing to do with my excellent editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. It's actually just the way Benny and I talk on these interviews. I've been talking to Benny for the show since he was about 10, and he is exactly the same. He makes a lot of noise. He, what we call it, eats the mic like he goes like this, right? He gets really close. He does all sorts of crazy things. He also did this interview while he was trying to eat a candy bar. Yes, you heard that correctly. He had already bolused for it, and then he brought it in with him. And I, you cannot eat and talk on the microphone at the same time. So we did have to cut it up a little bit more than I would normally expect to do. I know that those of you who have heard these interviews with Benny would expect no less. Okay, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Afrezza. And since starting this podcast, one of the highest interest topics has been Afrezza inhalable insulin. I am so excited to partner with them to tell you more. Afrezza is an ultra rapid acting mealtime insulin. You breathe it in using an oral inhaler. Once inhaled, Afrezza passes quickly through your lungs and enters your bloodstream in less than a minute and may start reducing blood sugars within about 12 minutes. Find out more, see if Afrezza is right for you. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Afrezza logo. Afrezza can cause serious side effects, including sudden lung problems and low potassium, and is not for patients with chronic lung disease, such as asthma or COPD, or for patients allergic to insulin. Tell your doctor if you've ever smoked, have ever had kidney or liver problems, a history of lung cancer, or if you're pregnant or breastfeeding. Most common side effects are low blood sugar, cough, and sore throat. Severe low blood sugar can be fatal. Do not replace long-acting insulin with Afrezza. Afrezza is not for use to treat diabetic ketoacidosis. Please see full prescribing information, including boxed warning, medication guide, and instructions for use on afreza.com slash safety. 
Hi, Benny. Welcome back to Diabetes Connections. I'm glad you could make some time to join us. I had nothing going on. So first of all, you were gone for eight weeks. Did Mm -hmm. you have any fun? Yeah. The first four weeks were a little bit more fun than the second, but that's nothing diabetes related. That's just how the camp goes. Tell us a little bit more about that, though, because and, and we do need to put a disclaimer that your claim to fame, you are known for always having something to complain about, even when you have a great time. <laughs> so I just want to put that out there. That's fair. I was in the CIT program. And the first month I was there, we lived kind of on our own little area of camp. And we were basically learning like how to be in a leadership position and how to like safely approach the kids. And then second session, we were they're called live-ins because we lived in the cabins with them. And that was not so much fun. So why wasn't that as much fun as you thought it would eight-year-olds be? eight-year-olds are a pain in the butt. <laughs> so first session we had, we were assigned to a cabin, but we were only with them for like an hour a day. And my kids were great. I loved them. They were funny. Uh, they didn't they listened to me. It was great. My second session kids were not as fun. Okay, that's fair. But you were also with them. So newsflash, kids yeah. are hard. You were with them 24-7. Yeah, I, flesh, I do not want to be a counselor anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to know. It's good to know. All right. So, but you had a good time. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was good. And you were with the, a lot of the same kids, I imagine, that you went to Israel with. Yeah. Uh, everyone that went to Israel was at camp. Oh, nice. And then plus a couple of people that didn't go. All right. So let's talk about diabetes. This camp has known you since you were eight years old. Mm-hmm. You know, you've had different, slightly different diabetes protocol every year as we learned what worked. But this time it was really different, especially for me, because I did not have any Dexcom numbers all summer long. Well, I guess we should back up. How do you feel like diabetes management went for you this summer? And I guess we should start by saying we know it was fine. Like nothing crazy happened. I mean, it was fine. Like I had highs, I had lows. It feels the same as when I'm at home. You know, I I don't really plan for stuff. It's just like, this is what's happening and this is what I'm going to do about it. I think you managed pretty much exactly the same way as you yeah. did at home. I mean, some years it's been different at camp. You know, we've had much more supervision over you or, you know, certainly the uh, staff at the, the health center yeah. is much more kind of worried about you. But we had a good combination this year of you being old enough to do more yourself, them wanting you to be independent and really fantastic staff at the mm-hmm. health center. Yeah. So I think it went really well. Yeah, this year's nursing staff is great. All right. So let's look up some questions from my listeners. What were your experiences with your pump and CGM at camp? Any frustrations? So you use the Tandem X2 T-Slim pump with the Dexcom G6 and the Control IQ system all together. The only real frustration I had was after like a year and a half of abuse, my pump decided to crack oh. off of a right. two foot fall. All right. Let's talk about the pump issue a little bit later on um, because uh. we definitely want to address that. But in terms of managing, yeah, no. you know, you're outside. Talk, maybe talk about what you carry with you, how you do that kind of stuff. I carried mostly emergency supplies with me, like some low supplies, um, a glucagon, a hypo pen, the nasal one. Bexime. I had Bexime. You um, had all three of yeah. them in your bag. I doubt you had all three of them in your bag. I looked. I had all three. <laughs> I had an in- extra insulin pen in the thing. The, oh, the Vivicap. The Vivicap. Vivicap? Vivicap. I don't know. Oh, Vivicap. I never used it. Right, but it's there to uh-huh. keep it cool. I had an extra inset or two in there at all times and an extra Dexcom. Awesome. Is it tough in that camp environment to keep that stuff on, to keep it, I'm going to say clean, even though I know you're not really worried about like being sterile, but like, you know, you're messy. It's, it's a messy environment. It's dusty. It's dirty. You're near the water. Not really. Yeah. No, it was always in a backpack. That backpack's destroyed. I love that backpack. I've had that for like six years. But it's in a backpack in its own bag. And so it's almost always sealed. Never really had any worries. And when I went to like change my inset, 90% of the time I was in the health center. Yeah. And you would go to the health center. Yeah. To change my uh, insulin, I would go up there. And most of the time I'd change my inset at the same time. Since you've been going to this camp for so long, we kind of have a routine when it comes to setting the basal rates up and, and all that stuff. And I meticulously go through and set up normal basal rate and then 10% 10% less, 20%, 30% less. You came home and told me you used none of that this year? I did the 15% less for like a day and a half. And I was going a little, I was holding a little lower than I wanted to be. So I went back to my normal settings. I wonder if that's control IQ. I have no idea. Too. Well, right. It doesn't really matter. Why? But you didn't use exercise mode or anything like that. No, I did not. Didn't need it. Didn't really have any issues with that. In years past, we've made it so that, especially when Benny was younger, we've made it so that the uh, health staff kind of came to him. In other words, you know, you think about these big camps, a lot of kids are getting medication mm-hmm. at 
the dining hall for dinner or for breakfast. So we would do things where they would have his infusion sets with him and be like, hey, it's been three days. You need to change it out. We've stopped doing that. You yeah. go yourself mm -hmm. and you change it out mostly when you change out your insulin. Yeah. I like how you're looking at me in the eye pretending you change your infusion set every three days. I used some of them. Oh, stop. I know you used some of them. So I took a lot of questions for you in my group. We're going to reference this a lot back mm. and forth during the episode. So Janice asked, did you have any scheduling issues with activities? In other words, like, did you need to delay a meal? Did you ever have something that interfered schedule-wise with diabetes tasks? I don't schedule diabetes around stuff. So no, no, nothing ever. Every once in a while, I had to like stop what I'm doing and sit down for a second because my blood sugar was going low, but... Or you'd run out of insulin, I'm yeah. sure, and you have to go to the health center. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how you bolused for meals, because the one time we kind of communicated about it, I was saying, as always, like, you know you're going to eat. Why don't you just bolus 25 carbs as you walk into the dining hall? And I know, no criticism. I know it's hard. Did you have any kind of routines like that at camp? No. I was very loose <laughs> on uh, corrective action. Why? Because I don't know. <laughs> I want to just be in your brain and say it's just what? It's like not that big a deal to me right now, you know? Like maybe when I'm older, I'll uh, care a bit more. <laughs> well, at least it's, it's honest. But if you're new around here, Benny's version of pre-bolusing is, oh, I'm eating, maybe I should bolus. Or, or I ate, maybe I should <laughs> bolus. So obviously we're, we're a little looser than many people, but he's very safe. Yeah. I would not let him do as much as he did if he was not safe. Oh, goodness. I don't know how I let you go anywhere, though. Okay, Margarita asks, was there any point in his trip that he wanted to update you? Did he call you with any T1D questions? Before you answer, the interesting thing about this year at camp was this was the first year that Benny had his phone. So he's gone to this camp since he's eight years old, but was never allowed anything with a screen. Yeah. So as a CIT, this was the first year he brought his phone. And mm -hmm. I was surprised, and we can talk about that in a minute, at how much we actually communicated, because I thought you would never want to text me all summer long. But you didn't really text me much about diabetes stuff. I think once or twice at the beginning. When it comes to communicating with you about stuff like from camp, it's not like um, a thought, like there's not a thought process that goes behind it. It's not, oh, I'm finally away from my mom. I don't have to talk to her about diabetes. It's like, oh, I should probably tell her about this or this, something stupid happened. I want to tell her. Well, the first thing I remember, the, really the only diabetes thing I remember is the first week you said, I'm not happy with how high and low I'm going when I eat. Like you felt there were more roller coasters. Mm -hmm. So we talked about... <laughs> Pre-bolusing <laughs> when you walked into the dining hall. That <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <It> wasn't subtle. <laughs> and you obviously uh, took that advice to heart. But that was the one thing you told me about. And then you, um, the only other communication I remember was uh, Dexcom. Everyone, I think we had two Dexcom situations. Well, we'll talk about your, your hand later on too. But we had um, very little Dexcom issues. Yeah. I was very surprised this year. Almost every year I've had some sort of Dexcom issue, whether it was connected to my pump or to my whatever that thing was called receiver. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, this year was, I didn't have any issues. And they it. stayed on, yeah. which surprised me too, because in years past, did you use overlays? No, but I did use a Dexcom overlay on my inset a couple of times because that's <laughs> what I had. <laughs> you never used it on your Dexcom? No. I didn't see any state put or anything mm -mm. like that. I thought I saw I it. got one of the... Dexcom decals you get you sent me. Yes, for the transmitter. Yeah. That was cute. But no, they stayed on surprisingly well this year. Okay. Denise asked, how did he learn how to wake up at night to treat lows? This is a big question that a lot of parents have. We've never really stressed this. So before I answer, I'd love to get your take on what you think is going on here. Well, when I first read the question, like the first couple of times I heard about people like asking me how I wake up to lows, it's like it was never a thought process. I've always just kind of waked up woken up like I, I didn't realize it wasn't something natural for some people i thought i was like in my head i assumed like oh my body's telling me to wake up because it knows there's something wrong i thought that was just kind of normal do you wake up to dexcom alarms no you just feel like you wake up when you're you feel low. i wake up you know when you wake up from a really good nap you're kind of sweaty you kind of like you got like the marks on you <laughs> it's that but more like discombobulated mm. and i check my dexcom i'm like oh i'm low Juice box. So you've woken up before and said, oh, I must be low. And then you realize the Dexcom alarm is going off. Because it's had to be going off if you're low. But that's not what wakes you that's up. That's not what, yeah. The Dexcom alert has no correlation to me realizing I'm low. Interesting. I will share for Denise and, and for others who've asked this question. And I've told this story a lot. We did not have a CGM between the ages of two and nine. You know, this was back in the day. Benny was diagnosed in 2006. They weren't as good as they are now. They only lasted a couple of days. 
And we waited. Um, and we waited until he wanted one when he got old enough to, to think about it. And we always said that, oh, he just wakes up when he's low. Oh, you know, we're really lucky. He just wakes because because you would wake up sometimes and be low. Mm-hmm. Then we got the CGM and realized that you had slept through a billion lows. You would be fast asleep and be 60. You'd be fast asleep and be 50. And, a, and if we let it ride a little bit longer, which we never did, especially when you were little, I let that happen a little bit more when you were a teenager, you would wake up a lot of the time, but not all the time, because we would, you know, you'd kind of wake up enough to drink a juice box and go back to bed. And I say all that because what we learned was not every low is going to be an emergency. Ask your endocrinologist about this as you listen. I'm not a medical professional. Obviously, you want to treat lows. But in our experience of not having a CGM for those seven years and realizing how many lows we missed, we realized that it would be okay to send him to camp. It would be okay to send him on sleepovers that, you know, a low blood sugar wasn't always an emergency. I'll put it like that. So ask your endocrinologist to explain the, the liver, how that comes into play a lot of the time, et cetera, and so on. Your kid can go to camp. All right, we're going to get to that. <laughs> we're going to get to Your that. kid can go to sleepovers. <laughs> Stop worrying. We will never stop worrying, but we will let you go. Stop worrying so much. Well, we'll see. I think. Do I, you want your kid to be normal or have diabetes? There's a very big difference there. Okay, I'm not gonna say. I'm put that in as me. I am saying that that is not related to Stacey Sims Media. No, no, no. I'm making a face because I'm sorry, sweetheart. You are far from normal. <laughs> I meant socially. Yeah. Well, I'll still challenge you on that. <laughs> That's so rude. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Stop eating. Oh, go ahead. Stop eating while we're talking. Jeez. <laughs> okay. This is also from Denise. Denise has a bunch of questions, which is, these are great questions. Did he ever go through a rebellious phase and quote, forget his diabetes? Now, Benny's been on the show a couple of times before, and we've kind of talked about this stuff. I'd love to know what your take on this is. Did I ever go through a rebellious phase? From my perspective, not really. I don't know about you, but. Never with diabetes. It was never like, you hear this from me all the time. And diabetes isn't something that like. Oh, I hate it. Blah, 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 you know, I think especially since I was diagnosed so young, it's always just been kind of part of my life. It's not like I've never consciously been like, oh, why did this happen to me? It's just always been something that's there. I would say, and you probably don't remember this, but in fifth and sixth grade, especially in sixth grade, you went through a time of, and I was stunned because it wasn't rebellious at all. You went through this brain fog phase where you would come home and, and I'd say, you know, we were still using a meter half the time, even though you were wearing a Dexcom sometimes. And we'd be like, oh, you know, what's your blood sugar? And you'd be 350. You'd say, oh my gosh, I thought I bolused, I forgot. And genuinely, I, I kid you not, you could tell you were frustrated, you wanted to do it, you mm-hmm. couldn't remember. We didn't want to put too many reminders in place at school because you were just getting more independent. So it was a lot of, a lot of frustration mm-hmm. on your part and our part too. But it wasn't a rebellion. It was just like, oh my gosh, I want to be independent, but I'm only 12 years old and I stink at this <laughs> and I can't remember, you know. So that's when we started texting mm-hmm. you with the watch at school. We didn't want to make you check in with the nurse. We came kind of close in sixth grade because I wanted to make sure you were feeling good enough to go yeah. to school. You know, you're, you were higher than. That's also when we started untethered and all that stuff. So things kind of got back to better, I'll say. All right. And then Denise's last question is for me. How did you as a mom learn to let go and not overprotect? And this is all in the context of camp. And I will say, Denise, I promise this isn't a plug, but I think you need to read the books. You know, there's two books that are, well, the second book's coming out soon, but The World's Worst Diabetes Mom and Still the World's Worst Diabetes Mom. I will give you the quick synopsis, but it goes much more in depth in the books. And I'm sorry to self-promote that way. But truly, a little at a time is the answer. Benny's had diabetes since he was two. We've been dealing with this for almost 16 years. I promise you that if he had been diagnosed last year, I would not have been ready to send him away for eight weeks with no Dexcom numbers on my part. You know, I just, it takes a little bit at a time. It takes getting through mistakes like we just talked about in middle school, mistakes like him going to a sleepover and being super low and trying to troubleshoot without a Dexcom at times where he wanted to fill his own pump and uh, refill his own pump and he forgot to remove it from his body, (laughs) right? Oh, remember that? So it takes a lot of mistakes and you I don't think you do stop worrying. I mean, my daughter without diabetes is almost 21. I still worry about her, right? But I let her go to college. I let her do all that stuff. It's not like you stop worrying miraculously one day. I think you just kind of have to let them. So that's, that's my answer to that, which I know is a tough one. It takes time and it takes work on your part to worry, but let them do it anyway. All right. So Nicole wanted to know, this is an interesting question for you. I don't know if you know this. When was the point he knew he was confident to take over in the context of camp? It just kind of happened. I think my family 
is pretty good at a casual, not casually, but gradually rolling independency onto us. There was never like a specific point I can remember. I was like, okay, I can do this. It was just kind of like, okay, I'm doing this now. What I would add is it is very gradual. And we were very lucky that this camp was willing to let him go. And the way I talk about it is he took care of his diabetes. I mean, you were only eight years old, which I still think was too young. I think we should have waited one more year. I know everybody thinks it worked out fine, but it was a little too young. But the reason he went, it was only for two weeks that first year, is because they assured me that they would watch you. And they did. Like that first night, when you talk about gradual, that first year, every night, they would take anybody who needed medication, and they threw you in there too, to the infirmary every night to give the kids medication, to check your infusion set, to make sure you had insulin, all of that stuff. So they had eyes on you every night. They also had eyes on you every meal, which was not good. And after the first, do you remember that? No. That was your huge complaint. You came home that summer and you were like, I'm not going back if they're watching what I eat. Because they would look at your plate and help you carb count. But then there were a couple of people, there was, most people were really cool, but there were a couple of people who were like, do you really need seconds? Do you want to eat more spinach and fewer pancakes or whatever it was? Like they got in your face a little bit because they were nervous, like people who don't understand diabetes enough often are. So we, we adjusted every year. I would say the biggest turning point for me, even though I knew you could do it sooner, was when you went to Israel. I still nag you all. I nagged you tonight about bolusing for dinner, right? <laughs> but it's really hard for me to take myself seriously after you went away for a month and did fine, 600 miles away. Did I say 600? 6,000 miles away. Sorry. I can't even comprehend it. An ocean away. Ah! And a sea. The dead sea. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that was so hard for me. All right. Julie asks, what is the biggest thing that's contributed most to his independence in managing his diabetes? What can parents do to support that throughout childhood? The fabulous mother, right? Yeah, the best. Yeah, mo the, oh, stop. The parents. A parent that has a kid with diabetes has even more responsibility to let their kid be responsible. If you do not let your kid be responsible and be independent with a support system, they will not be successful later in life when they don't have that support system. That's just a uh, harsh reality. If you can't let your kid be independent, they will be dependent on you until you are dying day. They're going to be struggling. Yeah. Do and you, you don't want to be 80 and in a wheelchair and have your kid come up to you and ask you how much you sh they should bowl us for pasta. I, I will say that that's true. We got really good advice when you were first diagnosed. You were, you were not yet two. And our amazing educator, Lynette Steinman, told me, I had a kid in here this week, Stacy, and that kid is going to college next month or whenever it was. And they do not know how to do their own injections. And so we're working on that. And I just want to let you know that I don't think that's a great way to raise your kids. And so while Benny obviously cannot be independent, we will start working on that throughout his life. And Lynette has two kids with type 1. They're both adults now. One is an endocrinologist in the Charlotte area. Uh, yeah, Jeremy, Dr. Jeremy Steinman now, Jeffrey's older brother. Jeffrey's, uh, we're more friendly with him. We just know him better. Uh, he's a counselor at Benny's camp. I had dinner with him. A, a dinner with him ago. recently. He's gainfully employed and not living <laughs> with his parents. You know, he's in his late 20s, I think. But that stayed with me. And I always wanted to raise you guys to be independent. So we were looking at that for a long time. But I'm, I'm, it's interesting to hear you say that. Did you ever think we put too much independence on you no. too early? Mm -mm. I think if, if you can't let your kid be independent, you're going to have issues. I mean, yeah. And I think it's okay to be age appropriate. Like yeah, I said, like you know, it's we, not be gradual with it. Don't like shove everything onto them and then say, I'm here if you need help. That's not helpful. That's a good point. Be like, okay, you're going to start doing this by yourself. This one very specific thing. And if you need help, I'm here. And then when that becomes the normal for them, add something else. Like, okay, you're going to do your insets by yourself now. If you need help, I'm here. And then two weeks or so go by and it's normal. Okay, now you're going to do your, your refill your cartridge by yourself. If you need help, I'm here. Not like, okay, you're doing everything. <laughs> good luck, have fun. <laughs> one thing that worked out really well for us, and I, I was worried it wouldn't at the time, was that you could do everything and you did it at sleepovers and at friends' homes and sports. But at home, we did everything for you. I, I did everything for <laughs> you. You know, if dad was around, he'd be like, do it yourself. But I did everything for you. Mm -hmm. And I worried for a long time that I was kind of stifling your independence. But I think that balance of giving yeah. you the tools and letting you do it at somebody else's house, but helping you. And when I say we did it for a long time, I mean, I was changing your infusion sets into middle school, me or dad. You could totally do them by yourself. Well, sixth grade. Benny made a face. I don't remember that. I wouldn't say 11, 11 or 12. What the really big turning point for everything, you could, you could definitely do it because you did him at camp. Mm -hmm. You did him at camp for a month every year and you did him at school and whenever, but you didn't like, well, nobody likes to do it, but you preferred that I did it if I was around. The turning point was the Dexcom G6 because it was much mm -hmm. easier to do. I've never done one of those. You've only ever done it for yourself. And once that came out, you actually, I don't think I ever did infusion sets again. Mm -hmm. 
So I think that was a big turning point for you. Let me figure out the year on that. I think that's like four and a half years ago already. Yeah. It's been, we've been waiting for the G7 for a long time. <laughs> Come on, guys. I also think independency wise, I think camp is like Morris is really good. Diabetes camp. Diabetes camp. Yeah. I know I've voiced my opinion on camp here before. For a kid that already kind of knew what they were doing, didn't really need too much help, you know, like needed needed help, but not in a sense where like they've never done anything before. It was, uh, you know, it's okay. It's nice to have some kids there that know what you're going through. But for a kid that's never done anything, I think it's great. You you did love it. I know you don't really remember it. You absolutely loved it between the ages of seven and 12. I, I mean, I think the younger years are perfect. I think if you're worried about your kid not being independent, send them to camp. I think it's the perfect way for you to trust your kid and for your kid to trust themselves. Do you remember any of the things they used to do at camp to celebrate you guys? Whenever anyone did something new for the first time, like they did their inset by themselves or they or sorry, their fusion site. Infusion site. Fusion. <laughs> We've said inset. I should, I should say this if I haven't. We say inset because that was a brand name that Animus used and we used Animus insets and the Animus pump for 10 years. And the two of us just realized in the last calendar year that that's a brand name and not the name of how a tubed pump is connected to the body. It's an infusion site. Infusion site. Infusion site. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a levi- set. It's Levi-Osa, not Levi-Osa. I think it's infusion set. And then that's the site dumb. is on your body. That's dumb. All right, you say whatever you want, levi I'm going to say inset okay. until my dying days. Perfect, perfect. We um, know what you mean. The first time you would ever do something, your counselor would go up during mealtime, like in front of the whole camp and go, Little Timmy did this for the first time. And everyone would go, yay! And yeah. It, it felt cool. good, right? Because mm-hmm. that happened to you a couple times, I think. Okay, so Jeffrey was my counselor one year. And I like how he approached kids doing stuff for the first time. The first night at camp, I had to change my inset. And he was like, you're doing it yourself. Or you won't have an inset. I was like, shh, shh, darn. <laughs> I really I need this. He's like, do it yourself. I ain't doing it. And so I did it. And he was like, yay! <laughs> and then he forced me to use chopsticks chopsticks a couple of years ago i went to dinner with him and oh he, yes i couldn't use chopsticks and he right. was like he, he took away my utensils he was like you're using the chopsticks <laughs> it's like i don't know how to use them his philosophy is definitely throw the kid into the, the swimming pool and see if he makes it but with a huge safety net obviously he wasn't gonna let yeah you go no no insulin. of course but yeah and that's that's how they did it and i, I think you were about eight or nine because the first year you went to camp you were seven and they tried to get you to do your set and you were kind of like no and you kind of like got halfway there like you put your hand on it when somebody else did it so they were really gradual about it which was great that's cool i'm glad you like diabetes camp helped me send you to regular camp because you'd go for a week for many years the first year you went to diabetes camp that was it and then the next summer you went for a week and then you went to camp coleman the regular camp Mm -hmm. and so we kind of got into a rhythm of this is the, the run-up to it. We, we can change set. You can change uh, uh, settings. We can see how your body's going to react to a really active environment. And then here's all the supplies we need to take. So it really was like a dress rehearsal in a way, although that's not really fair to the, the, you know, the real stage of a month away from home. Um, but again, very gradual. And you know, uh, keep in mind when he goes to this camp, like I just, I'm so nervous all the time, but he's fine. All right. So let's talk about the decision not to share. And then we're going to talk about your broken pump and your broken <laughs> hand. When you went to Israel, we did share. Mm-hmm. We used share and follow, but we had a whole system in place because I actually thought that was a pretty bad idea, even though you said you wanted to do it and I didn't want I didn't want to tell you no, and it worked out really well. I don't I think I had two or three urgent alerts the whole time you were gone, but we had a system. I knew who to call. Mm-hmm. At this camp, we've never shared because the first couple of years you went, you did not have a CGM. You didn't have a CGM with share. That wasn't a thing for a long time. And there's no good Wi-Fi and you never had your phone. Yeah. So this year you had your phone. Mm-hmm. How did you feel about not sharing with your mommy? That was great. <laughs> I think if you're in the same house, it makes sense to share. But like, if you're not consistently living, at least within a vicinity of someone, it just doesn't make sense. It's an extra worry on one person, on the person looking at it. And it's extra pressure on the person with diabetes, with the CGM. Yeah. And I'll take that just a step further to kind of, I, I think this is what you mean. And tell me if I'm wrong. It's more like if the person that's following doesn't really have an easy way to get in touch. I mean, I could have called you. I could have called the counselors, but I couldn't have walked over and knocked on the door or brought yeah. you a juice box, that kind of thing. So did you share and follow with anybody else at camp? I've yeah. done that before. No, you didn't. Mm-mm. What was the reason you didn't share with anybody at camp? I didn't think about it. If it had been brought up like during camp, I probably would have ended up sharing with one of the counselors I really liked. Because you've done that before. Mm-hmm. It just like didn't cross my mind. Didn't, And you didn't really need it. Yeah. When you're in a cabin, because you're, you're, this is the real reason why I don't worry 
incredibly much when you're gone because you're in a cabin with all these other people, which is not my cup of tea. But mm. yes. didn't you go to camp too? I did. I oh did my, my whole childhood. And I loved it, but I can't imagine doing it again. <laughs> but you're in a cabin with all these other people and your alarms are going off. Maybe no, your alarms are not going off ever. I'm, no, I'm perfect. My point is they're wake. And these alarms are going off. And so people can wake up. If your alarm went off to the, he's shaking his head. If your alarm went off to the point where it was, you were not treating, somebody is going to say, turn that off or what's going on. Not everybody sleeps that heavily, do they? Are you going to make me worry now? My alarms are quiet. But if you don't treat the urgent low, it doesn't stay quiet. Oh, yeah, true. You've been in a situation before at camp where someone's woken up, right? When you were younger. I don't remember. Yeah, absolutely. Didn't you get an award once, like most likely to wake people up? No, no, because I woke up and would wake my counselor up to take me to the house center. Oh, okay. Because I ran out of low supplies. (laughs) Jeez. Oh, like we should have talked about that. So what did you do? What did you keep in the cabin? I mean, I know because I helped pack it, but. Juice box. Crackers. Juice box. Juice box and crackers, and we kept and it. And gummies. Oh, and gummies. And, but it's all in. And I ordered Cheez-Its. That's right. You could order off of Amazon, which I thought was bananas. I ordered food. But they, um, we kept everything in Tupperware sealed containers with you know, a snap-on lid because you're in a cabin. You really have to be careful about food. So that was always something I worried about because I wanted you to have the juice box next to you and not have to get out of bed. Did you at least do that or have a gummy like in the bed with you? They were always right next to me. Out of the container. Mm-mm. So you're low and you're getting out of bed and you're opening no, the No, I'm not getting out of bed. They're... I roll over and the box is right there. Oh, so you're on the floor. You're on the lower bunk. Okay. I was always on the lower bunk. Because I bought you like nifty little bedside caddy things. And now I know that this year you didn't even take it with you. I was very insulted. Oh, bedside caddy. Thing. The thing, the fabric shelves that hang down. Oh. When you... I would have to get a bed for that. face the wrong way. <sighs> <laughs> you have limited space in bunks and cabins. And then Leah loved those because there was always extra space. You could put towels and socks and letters because she would write letters home because she's a nice child. All right. Skipping ahead. Yeah, she was great. Great at camp. Much better than you. So let's talk about the disasters that happened. We had two, <laughs> we had two problems at camp. Obviously, you're fine, but your pump broke. What happened there? I was refilling a cartridge in the health center, and I put it down on a cardboard box, maybe two feet in the air, and it fell, and the entire screen shattered. After like a year and a half of me throwing that thing and like dropping it on wood and bunch of other stuff. You're not gentle with your equipment. No. It decided to break, and it was very rude. It's interesting. I'm going to see if I can get the glass replaced, because it looks like the pump is still working. Oh, yeah. No, the pump works perfectly fine. Yeah, but you can't see it. Mm. All right. But that pump was actually our backup, kind of, to yeah. begin with. Benny's pump went out of warranty last fall, almost a year ago now. And so we got a new pump. We went through the whole thing with insurance. But we were waiting to update it and plug it in, because we were waiting for mobile bolus. So we're like, we'll just wait. We'll just wait. And then finally, I sent you to camp with the new pump mm-hmm. ready to go. We plugged it in. We put all the settings in it, but it wasn't updated or anything. So when that broke, you very easy. You just took out the other pump. Yeah. And you were so surprised that I had put all the settings in it. You'd forgotten about that. So that was nice. Uh-huh. You don't remember that? You sent no, me the I nicest do. text. You were like, yay. I would have to worry about it. And then mobile bolus had already come out. Mm-hmm. So you updated it at the health center. Set in the health center. Actually, it took me a while to actually get it updated because... Oh, the all-knowing health center people didn't know the password to the admin. Oh, no. The admin password to the computer. So, like, on some computers, you know, you need an admin password to download stuff, download installers. Sure. And they didn't know the password. I don't know how they didn't know the password, but they didn't know the password. First, I had to find someone else with their computer. Then I had to find some internet. And then I had to hope they had a USB. So I would found two people with MacBooks that didn't have a USB. <laughs> so I finally got it downloaded. And I made you go through all the training. <laughs> oh, my God. I love Tandem, and I love the FDA, <laughs> um, but that training was redundant. Yeah. Well, that's the first time you've ever had to do anything like that, so welcome to adulting. You can do them all from now on. It was, it was all like, make sure you have notifications turned on on your phone. If you have an iPhone, this is how you turn on notifications. Do you, uh, before we go on to your hand, do you like mobile bolus? Love it. Yeah. I use it almost every time I bolus now. Yeah, it looks to me like you're, you're really, well, I shouldn't say it. Uh, it looks to me like you're really using it. And I know you like it a lot. So yay, I'm glad to hear that. That's awesome. All right, let's talk about your hand because you really can't go a summer without getting hurt. (laughs) You're doing fine now. We should say you're going back to the doctor, I think in another week. I have no idea. Yeah, I'll look on the calendar. I share this in the Facebook group. So a lot of people already have seen the pictures of you with the pink cast and they know what happened. I broke my fifth metacarpal, which is the, the bone that connects your pinky finger to your wrist. 
we don't have to go through the whole story, but what was great is this camp, and this is why I trust them with the diabetes stuff. You know, they took you to the urgent care, they took mm-hmm. you to the hand surgeon, they got it all set up. You obviously were in touch with me. Uh, you and the nurse were a little too uh, sarcastic. Let's just put it that way. I'm not quite sure how to say it. You and Neri were great. I yeah. love Neri. Yeah. We love her great, so much. But it was so funny. Like, first you called me with the pump, like, hey. <laughs> then you're like, hey. Called me with a hand, hey. <laughs> So I knew nothing too terrible was going on, but you felt like you were in good hands. Yeah. Ah, no pun intended. I hate you. Did, but you really yeah. did. Yeah, no, it was great. Was it really painful? No. It felt like I stubbed my finger. You know, like you kick a wall and I stub your toe. It yeah. felt like that on my hand. All right. What was the best part of camp? Um, okay. So we have color work camp and one of our events is called Rope Burn. It's at the end of the second day at night. It's supposed to be ours. It was in the next morning because it rained. Oh. Um, it was still fun. So two teams and there are ropes 10, 12 feet in the air. And you have to build a big fire and burn them. The catch is the sticks can only be six feet tall. That's as tall as they can get. So you need a lot of sticks and a lot of tall sticks. Whoever but, burns the rope first wins. Yeah. Do you have to burn it completely? Yeah, it has to snap in half. Got it. The fun part is the two teams the entire day beforehand are in the woods collecting sticks. It's not like, here's wood, right. go build a fire. It's go collect firewood, bring it back, make a plan, build a fire, burn a rope. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. You've watched this since you were yeah, nine, eight or nine every years year old. Did, since did I was you always think about eight. wanting to do it? Mm-hmm. What I liked about it was, um, you know, I saw a lot of pictures, obviously, and you had these two troughs of water, like these giant, you know, a trough is a big bucket of water, but like man-sized troughs of water. So you could, well, that's what it's called. It's not a bucket. I mean, I want people to get a visual of what it was. And there were obviously there for safety, mm-hmm. but it was also there for you guys to cool off. And like everybody was pictured in them after. It was so funny. It's kind of a tradition. The water is, I don't know how, but the water in those is always freezing cold. They're metal containers, which yeah. helps. Well, even, I mean, they're like four feet from the fire. Yeah. They're right next to the, these giant fires and they stay cool for like half an hour of a blaze right next to them. And 99% of the time they're there for during or after when you're hot and sweaty because you have to wear uh, long sleeve shirts, long pants, cotton the entire time. So you're hot and you have to do a big fire. So you're hot. You know, obviously, they're there just in case someone catches on fire. Jeez. The fire, the nearest town, it's firefighters. They always have a truck there oh, just in cool. case. That makes sense. No one's ever gotten actually hurt doing it. It was nice and cold when you jumped in. Oh, my God. It's great. <laughs> I think that's it for camp stuff. Let me just think about here as we wrap it up. And you're thinking about going back next year. Yeah. That's part of the media team. That's pretty cool. So you'll be taking the pictures and videos and things like that. And no responsibility for kids. Anything else diabetes wise you want to share? What I worry about the most is not so much a diabetes emergency, because I think for any medical emergency, obviously, you, I say you broke your hand or whatever it really is, you know, but they take care of the kids, right? There's always kids with medical emergencies. But I worry that you like everybody's doing something fun and you're sitting there treating a low and you're sad or, you know, your blood sugar's too high. So you're sitting down and you're not able to participate and you're sad. I know that you've dealt with this long enough. It doesn't really seem to happen. But what is your advice for other kids? Like, what would you tell parents and kids about that kind of stuff? This sounds cold hearted and I know it does. Just deal with it. You literally can't do anything about it. My thought process in life is if I can't do anything about it, don't get upset over it. So in other words, like you can you can try to prevent low blood sugars by mm-hmm. not by knowing how much to dose, yeah. but they're still gonna happen. Like if you go low during a football game or something, I don't know, go sit out, go treat it, get back in the game. Who cares? You went low, deal with it, like fix it, deal with it emotionally too, because yeah. it's, it's not that deep. If your blood sugar goes low and you have to sit out of something for a couple minutes or, you know, until your blood sugar goes, oh, it sucks. You know, I know it sucks, but there's nothing you can do about it. Parents, there's nothing you can do about it. Kids, there's nothing you can do about it. If you go low, you go low. I would add, as the parent, uh, I think that's actually a really healthy attitude. I would also say implied in that is not asking the child in the moment, what did you do wrong? Yeah. What did you do? How did this happen? Mm-hmm. Um, because the only answer right there is, well, I happen to have type 1 diabetes. If you think something happened that you can fix, in other words, okay, you're playing football and we probably should back off on the basil or we need to have a snack before, you know, then the next day you can Mm -hmm. say, we're going to talk to the endocrinologist, you know, talk to the kid. Hey, let's see if we can make that better. But I agree. I think in the moment, especially is not the time to try to fix things and to realize that we'll never be perfect. Mm -hmm. So I I, I think you're very blunt, but I I think your attitude serves you pretty well. Why don't you bowl this before you eat? (laughs) What the hell? My one piece of standing advice that I say almost every time you ask me at the end of these, parents, you're not going to be perfect. Your kid's not going to be perfect. Don't micromanage them. They will not like you. (laughs) 
the end. Good night. Thank you. I'll be here all night. <laughs> to that end, one of the things I do talk about and still the world's worst diabetes mom, I know this is the second time I've mentioned it, but it's on my mind because I was just proofing the final version. One of the things that I talk about is how I worry sometimes that I have sacrificed, you know, perfect blood sugars and more time in range for you and, you know, these incredible A1Cs in exchange for you not only being independent, but for us having a really nice relationship. I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say this, I'm knocking wood here because, you know, you've got a, you know, childhood's not over yet. It's close. We do have a really nice relationship. Mm -hmm. You still talk to me. Here you are being silly (laughs) in my office. You come visit me in my office. You know, we do hang out. You watch, we watch shows together. I guess what I'm asking is, if I had been more on top of you, I'm still wrestling with that, right? Do you think it would have been a problem? I think you did perfect. Oh, you're so sweet. I wouldn't change, I wouldn't, truly, I wouldn't change anything. I love that you don't see me as a bunch of numbers. You're going to make me cry. (laughs) (laughs) Now you're not going to make me cry. You've ruined the moment. (laughs) I think that's, that's wonderful to hear. As you listen, I will say that there's still a voice in my head saying, boy, that's great, but I... Sometimes I wish I were stricter, <laughs> right? You know what? What I have to say to that is I am not you. Yeah. My biggest thing is when I see parents treat their kid how they think they would want their diabetes to be treated and you're going about it wrong. I know some kids aren't like conscious enough, but your kid is still a different person. You can't treat them in a way you think is the perfect way to do things. Are you saying that a 17-year-old boy might manage diabetes differently than a 50-year-old woman? I am. <laughs> I am. That's but I, crazy. But that makes sense. It really does. And as much as you drive me crazy, I have to respect that. And I have to kind of give you, give you the reins. Oh, my gosh. Ma! You first came on the show, I think, in 2015 and did the exact same <laughs> nonsense. I mean, chicken noises. And, uh, Benny, thank you so much for joining oh, you're me. You're welcome. That'll be $200 really, really in my time. really appreciate yeah. that. Please make sure you sign the disclosure on your way out the door. The NDA. <laughs> Seriously, kiddo, I really appreciate it. Yeah. And we're talking right before school starts. We're going to have a talk in the next week or two about how you want to manage at school because we do this every year. And even though I already know what the answer is, this is my last chance for high school for you um, as a minor. So we're um, going to have one more discussion of what um, your goals for the year are and whether you'll be allowed to eat in the cafeteria. That was your ask in first grade. Your sister was eating in the cafeteria and you wanted to do the same thing. And I was making you bring lunch from home every single day with a carb oh, count. eating food from the cafeteria. Oh, yeah. Not eating in the cafeteria. <laughs> yeah, we made you eat in the broom closet under the stairs. Like, what? <laughs> you wanted to buy food from the cafeteria. All right. Thanks, kiddo. Love you. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. Yeah, never a dull moment with that kid. I will link up some other interviews that we've done, you know, me and Benny, uh, in the past, if you are brave and would like to go listen. I'll also link up some of the the episodes where I've talked about non-diabetes and diabetes camp, where I just talk about camp. It's just been such a big part of our lives, and I hope we didn't presume too much knowledge there. You know, if you have any questions about anything you heard, please reach out. Uh, You can certainly ask me. I've done some uh, webinars for parents about how we manage, you know, down to everything we tell the staff uh, when Benny was much younger, how we handled it. So I'm more than happy to share with you. And as I mentioned in the interview, and I'm sorry for the self-promotion there, but, you know, the books really managed to talk about it a lot too. And in the, the second book, Instill the World's Worst Diabetes Mom, I go really in depth about how we send him to Israel and the prep that we did for that, which is a lot like prepping for a non-diabetes camp. I also should mention, we talked about the Vivi cap, and it is pronounced Vivi. <laughs> We were wondering there during the interview. I saw them at ADCES, the Diabetes Educator Conference that just happened a couple weeks ago. And they have a new version of their pen cap. It's a little bit more robust. And we are talking about doing some stuff together since we're such big fans of the product. So you may be hearing that in the months or weeks to come. But as of right now, full disclosure, they're not a sponsor. We did get that product for free before Benny went to Israel in 2021. But we really do love it. I plan to buy it again. They don't last forever. You can't replace a battery. That's the only downside of it, at least in the version we have. Okay, let's talk about events, not just Mom's Night Out, but some other stuff coming up in just a second. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. And if you're a veteran, the Dexcom G6 CGM is now available at Veterans Affairs VA pharmacies in the United States. Qualified veterans with type 1 and type 2 may be covered. Picking your Dexcom supplies up at the pharmacy may save you a lot of time, too. Connect with your doctor for more information. 
Dexcom even has a discussion guide you can bring with you. Get that guide. Find out more about eligibility at Dexcom.com slash veterans, or you can just go to diabetes-connections.com, click on the Dexcom logo, and navigate to veterans on their site. Wanted to take a minute and look ahead to talk about what's coming up, where we're going. I am traveling a bit in, not so much in September, which seems to be a quieter month. Maybe it'll help me get ready for October. But the very first weekend of October, I'm going to Healthy Voices. This is a really interesting conference for many different kinds of health advocates, not just for folks with diabetes, although I have met some amazing diabetes advocates there over the years. This is the makeup for the 2020 conference that was canceled. So hopefully, fingers crossed, all will be well. I'm going there. It's in Philadelphia this year. So if you're going, let me know for sure. Looking ahead, the next week is Friends for Life in the Washington, D.C. area. Then the following weekend, D.C. area again for the She Podcasts conference. I'm doing a little less than I did last year. I was really working more in the podcasting field last year and um, have taken a step back because I wanted to do my own event, the Mom's Night Out, and my book and things like that. But I'll still be going there as a speaker, and I'm talking about ethical monetization, talking about how to make money with your podcast without being a complete shill about the whole thing. And as I say, a complete disclosure, I don't mind sharing that with you. I enjoy making this podcast free. I never want to ask you for money. And to me, the best way to do that is to have a couple of commercials in there. So that's that weekend. Then it gets a little quiet. And then in November, November 12th, I will be in Florida for the Macy's Believers Gala. This is such a nice event. I'm thrilled they asked me to MC. I'm also doing a book event that morning with them. So very excited to be hanging out with the Macy's Believers. And a lot of folks from the Children with Diabetes Friends for Life crew will be there as well. And then it'll be Thanksgiving, folks. So, oh my gosh, I'm not trying to rush away this year. But as I look at my calendar, it is going to fly by. I also want to mention I am already speaking to some groups about kind of making a book tour and coming to events in 2023. I kid you not, we are planning for next year already. So JDRF friends or other folks having conferences next year, if you're having events, I would love to come and speak to your group, talk about not trying to be a perfect diabetes parent, and lots more. All right, thank you as always to my editor, John Buchanan at Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you so much for listening. We will have a newscast this week. We are, for the foreseeable future, back to our regular schedule. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here soon. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged. <laughs>